Folks, I think I've uncovered the secret to defeating the matrix, to getting out of the rat race. And the one and only Derek, that ADU guy is going to bring it to us. So Derek, what do you, what is the secret, at least in my opinion, to getting out of the rat race that we're going to uncover today? Yeah, Zuber, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. I would say the secret to getting rich and freeing your mind is living in a smaller home. That cannot be true. Everybody has told me, go bigger, go bigger. You've got to trade up. It's it's a sign of what kind of man you are, that you can have a big home and have all of this space for stuff. What gives? Yeah, yeah, good point. So I, I know you personally as a friend, and I know you went from 1,300 square feet in the Silicon Valley to some huge house in the hills <laughs> in Vegas that's four or 5,000 square feet. And um, not to poke fun at that, but I would <laughs> beg... Um, to ask you, is it easier to clean your old house or your new house? Do you have more free mind space in your no old house or in your new house? The biggest takeaway that I've learned over the years of living in a small house is the fact that uh, there's a bunch of um, prefacts like, hey, it's way cheaper. It's way easier to clean. It's more efficient. It's easier to heat. It's cheaper. But the biggest gain I've found is in my mind. If you have less stuff around you, and I'm not talking about being a minimalist and only having 100 items. I'm just saying yeah. living in a smaller house, you have so much more capacity in your mind that's not taken up by space around you, space that you think you need to fill, space you need to clean, space you need to heat. And this is a trend that's not just, uh, we'll call the tiny house movement. We're seeing big national home builders go after huge profits by building smaller houses. No, I think I think you're absolutely right. And and back to your question, um, one of the keys to Olivia and I earning financial freedom was living in a tiny house, right? We bought a home in 1999 that was about 1,300 square feet, three levels, so it's a very small footprint. It's a condo, so it's not even a house, and we lived in it for well over 20 years, and that was one of the reasons we could do what we did is we didn't increase our housing costs. We didn't buy more stuff. Like we have one couch, right? We changed the couch. I think one time in 20 years, right? We had one couch. We've got two beds, right? Ours and our daughters. Um, there's a third room, a third bedroom that we used as a, as an office. It was just less stuff. Now, you know, poking fun at me, rightly so you should. Uh, we just picked up a, you know, almost 5,000 square foot house in, in Vegas. Uh, we have two, couches that if we put it in our old home would take up every square inch of our living room. These, these couches, the couches are almost 10 grand a piece, right? Just stuff, right? We now have five bedrooms. And of course, one of the things about having a place in Vegas is we hope to have family and friends over. So guess what? Now we have five beds in mattresses and, you know, nightstands and just, just the window cleaning in this freaking place is more expensive than the maid service. So it is wildly expensive. And I really do think the key to financial freedom is controlling your living expenses. And for lots of us, that is living in a tiny ho house or a smaller footprint and not moving for decades. Once you get to the end, you are free to do whatever the hell you want. But I can promise you this, Derek, I would not be having this conversation with you today. You and I would probably not be friends if I traded up twice when I was employed. I would still be working. I would still be slaving away. Gosh, I'd still be flying on airplanes, which is the least favorite thing for me to do in my entire life. But it's the only way I could make money. So living in a tiny home is absolutely how Olivia and I got here. So well said. Yeah, you know, I think that there's still in our society the status symbol of the nice new cars and the big house. And so many of my friends, you know, will will trade up. Like you said, you know, they're they're doing well financially. They've got good credit. They can qualify for a new mortgage. They sell their home and buy a bigger one. And you know what we do and what you teach is, is um, you know, you you keep the home as a rental and you go buy another one. Some of the, mm -hmm. the, the best contributors to your channel talk about house hacking, um, mm -hmm. talk about living below your means, talking about trading sideways and not getting that lifestyle creep. And it's not just about buying another latte or getting a newer car. The biggest piece of lifestyle creep that I see is people buying bigger houses, usually yes. selling the one yes. that they have that's perfectly fine as opposed to putting it into service as a rental, but buying 
right. in bigger houses. And this isn't just my opinion as an uh, an ADU developer and somebody that's been in the small housing space forever. Like I said earlier, it's like these big home builders are are going off right now. So we've got a little bit of a case study I'll bring up. We've got Lennar Homes in San Antonio, Texas. They're fairly close to Randolph Air, Air Force Base. Um, they've got this new development model that they're using, and they're building these one bedroom, two bath. 661 square foot homes. They're narrow. Mm-hmm. They're kind of like a, a row house. It's very similar to what you would think of as a townhouse in your mind, mm-hmm. but they're non-shared wall. Right. They started at about 150 and I think they're up to about 159. So we're talking $150,000 for a brand new house in a state that a lot of people want to live in, in a maintained planned you know, community development. And they're flying off the shelf. I was looking at some of their data and everything that they have previewed is already sold. Like they can't Mm. build these things fast enough. And it's not just because they're more affordable, which they are, which people on this channel need to hear, buy more affordable housing, reduce or eliminate your number one housing expense and think of how that will supercharge your investing career. But it just makes sense. I mean, two thirds of all US households, 62%, according to the last census data, are two people or less. A 30% of all households in our country are one person. And I don't want to call it like the divorce movement or the single movement, but there's just a lot more people that are looking for a more practical way of living. We don't have these larger families, you know, population um, density within the U.S. household um, is is shrinking, not not because families are getting smaller, but because families are going their separate ways. So there's Mm -hmm. a ton of data that supports this. And and, you know, when there's onesie twosies here and there with the ADU movement, you don't hear about it as much. But when Lennar, you know, has a paid ad in the New York Times about this stuff, we start to hear it yeah. more mainstream. So watch, watch what's going on. Yeah, I can't wait to hear from Lennar. Lennar reports earnings this third, might be Wednesday, either Wednesday or Thursday. I think it's Wednesday. Uh, I want to see how they, if they talk about San Antonio, they're also doing one in, I think it's Paradise, Arizona. They're doing mm-hmm. 996 square feet. I think the key, one of the keys to the housing problem we're in is smaller homes. But when I step back and talk to the audience, again, if you can live in a smaller footprint, it unlocks the path to getting wealthy, right? What is step one to getting wealthy? I talk about creating discretionary income. If you can attack your largest expense, X taxes, which is housing, as opposed to the latte, and if you could do that for a decade, all that money falls to the bottom line. I mean, look at our example. We lived in a smaller home for 20 years. We bought, you know, two couches in 20 years. This freaking new place we've got, we spent more on couches than we probably did all the furniture in the in the old house. Just think about the the all of that capital that could have rolled in and compounded over 20 years. That's how Olivia and I got to be here, is because we sacrificed um live below our means, stayed tight. I mean, you you can only put so much in a three-story condo, right? It just takes a lot to get stuff upstairs. So, Mm -hmm. you know, now you got a big old, big old house. It's, you know, it's it's easier to fill it up with junk. So it it is such the key. I want to ask you a question. What's the smallest home you've lived in? You know, if I go back to my early days when my my mother and I lived in different small studios or uh, really I talk about I was house hacked growing up. Um, I was a, you know, single child with a single mom growing up. We lived in these small houses or converted garage in these dense areas. And I lived in 300 square feet several times. Um, mm-hmm. Currently, right now, today, I live in 524 square feet. And um, that's that's pretty small, you know, and it's it's more than I need. There's still spots, corners of this house that I don't even go in. There's still areas that I don't need. If I if I think and we all think all the listeners right now, just think of the areas in your home where your feet have actually touched the ground. Think of square footage that you've actually stepped on. Think about when you're when you're vacuuming up the corners. You never even go into those areas. So even in 524 square feet, um, I feel like I'm overpaid and in too large of a house. And mm-hmm. I'll add to the end of that there, Zuber, that I haven't paid for a mortgage out of my own pocket in over 15 years. That's the key. And so right people there. think, why does Derek live in this tiny house? Well, I, I like to invest my money and I like to have a free mind. So the other side of the sacrifice of living smaller, if you think it's a sacrifice, is think of how much um, you could supercharge your investing career if you haven't had a housing payment in 15 years. 
Well, that's the key, right? I want to, I, you know, when you're in the journey, you know, I'll just say it this way. My friends made fun of me. I don't know if your friends made fun of you when you live in tiny homes, but my they still friends do. Did. Yeah, my friends do. Or did. They don't. Do, it's funny how my friends don't make fun of me now, but that's a different story. Uh, but they did make fun of me and they talked behind our back. And, you know, they said things like, poor Olivia, she's got to do this. She's got to do that. You know, Zuber, you know, he's doing okay. They should do this. They should do that. And they just didn't see what we were doing. Right. They didn't see. And it takes time, right? It takes a decade to do this. But if you're willing to do that, where I wanted to go to is not only do you have you not had a mortgage payment for 15 years, I've seen your Facebook page and I've seen how what you choose to do. How does Derek spend his time, right? You do a lot of trail runs. You 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 go on these fun ski trips. You do all of these fun things. Why? Because you chose to live in a smaller footprint. You don't have a mortgage payment and you can enjoy life. Derek does what he wants, when he wants, with whom he wants. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, that's um, absolutely true. And I'd say most of that is... Um due to my housing choices and due to my delaying gratification. And I can really, really relate to what you said about people making fun of you and, and people, you know, the haters are going to hate. Um, Elon Musk has one of my favorite quotes ever. He was asked about the rockets exploding when he was trying to get into space. And the first three blew up the fourth one, everybody thought was going to fail and he made it. And somebody asked him how he felt. And he said, people will always laugh at you before they applaud. And now when we're in the positions we're in where we're comfortable and we do what we want and people see us having a good time and living a simple life, they they cheer for us. You know, I, I loved hearing your story. I think you were on um, Panetta's show when you were talking about leaving a party with Olivia and all your colleagues, your underlings, yeah. people that were subordinate to you making way more money than you. And you were just like distraught. And mm -hmm. um, I bet now looking back, you were like, no, I was right <laughs> where I was supposed to be. And you can have it, you know, now or you can have it forever. So the this amazing the lifestyle- key. I get to to live is another reason why I think other people are wanting to buy these smaller, more affordable houses. Travel is more important. You know, people are driving less. People are all about commuting on bike or by foot. So you don't need the parking. People want to go travel abroad. It's a lot easier to do that when you don't have this huge house filled with pets and plants. The, mm -hmm. the mindset of the consumer is also changing. So to, to live a more free lifestyle, having a smaller house and less stuff just really helps. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I will applaud the fire movement for, which is very few things because they, they've attacked me all the time, is they really have got people to think about the number. Like, what is your nut? What is your financial nut? And if you really can remove housing from that or make it, you know, a zero line item, you're much like you're much closer to the end. Right. If you only need thirty five hundred bucks to live, let's say you need four grand, but of that fifteen hundred is housing. Well, guess what? Live in a tiny house, live in an ADU in the backyard, whatever it is. Take that line item to zero. Now you need twenty five hundred. It's easier to build buy assets that cash flow that produce twenty five hundred than four grand. It's simple math, and that means you're just you don't have to do it forever, but a little while, and, and you can do what you want later. Yeah, so so well said, Zuber. Love that. Yeah. So let's talk about living in a house of 524 uh, square feet. Let's just paint a vision, right? You open the front door. What are we looking at? Yeah, so I live in this simple design. It's a rectangular box with a loft. If anybody on here um, wants to see the exact house I live in, if you go to my Instagram, that ADU guy, you can see pinned on my first reel is my house. It says, this is the 524 square foot house and how I live. But you walk into this large, great room. It's got 16 foot tall vaulted ceilings. There's a small bathroom and a small office downstairs. And then there's a sleeping loft above the bedroom and bathroom. That's an additional 200 square feet. That um, is where I put my bed. And I've I have got your Instagram up. Look at that. Yeah, that is it right there. That's my house. Um, simple covered front porch. I've got some ski storage, some attic yep. storage above that. That's and amazing. then I um, have a single, simple one wall galley yep. kitchen. Yep, but I it's see nice, it. you know. Yeah. Just because it's small doesn't mean it's not nice. You know, we use real hardwood floors, custom cabinets, granite countertops, stainless appliances. I, I go with a really nice slide in high end range. The only thing I splurge on when I build these little units is a really nice stove range. Um, I see that. Yep, and just yep. this weird thing. But that's uh, the, the simple the housing that we live in right now. And 
And I think okay. other people should too. But at least yeah, consider it, it. Yeah, I love the loft. Look at that. That's maximizing yeah. square footage right there. Yeah, for sure. And this isn't, you know, we don't sell anything. Um, not that no. there's anything against that, but we give those, you know, the plans away. Our YouTube channel shows people how to build that. I did a 17 part video series, seven and a half hours of content on exactly how we built that from the wow. ground up, literally from me digging a hole in the ground for the foundations to putting the doorknobs on every step, all 200 steps of how to build it. You can go watch if you're curious of how we do it. Yeah. I, 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 again, you got a dishwasher in there, full stove, full fridge, granite. looks like that's, what is that? Is that granite or what is that? Yep. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. 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 And Very we build good. these for we build these affordable. So the 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 thing I'm most proud of about these smaller houses that I promote and that I try to tell and teach other people and influence other people to build is they're affordable. Yeah. I mean, as a general contractor and a workaholic that works dark to dark, I don't expect people to meet my numbers, but we built that for just over sixty thousand dollars. And um, in today's market, you know, if that's on its own lot, it may be worth three or $400,000. So you can also force a lot of appreciation while living in a small affordable house. And that happened to come with a small primary house and the primary house covers the whole 30 year debt mortgage payment. So that's how we live for free is you buy or build houses with small houses uh, attached to them or right beside them and eliminate your number one expense, which is housing. So if it took, again, Let's, dark to dark, you do it yourself, all of that, it took you 60 grand. What was the timeline from when you broke ground to you moved in? Was it three months? Well, how long is this Yeah, take? Yeah, we built we built both of the houses, the primary, the larger house, and the ADU in um, 90 days exactly. And we did it all in real time, sharing the process, as well as our costs on the YouTube channel. But yeah, 90 days. And that's, again, is 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 because we've been doing this a long time. I wouldn't expect everybody to be able to do that, but it is possible. Right. So if you were to if you were to step back and if you know somebody was going to take your plans and they were going to do it in their backyard in their neighborhood, uh, if we wanted to set realistic expectations, would you say 120 grand might be a better number to kind of ballpark, and then you know five months or what? What do we think? Yeah, yeah. I would say double the price, so 120k. And depending on your jurisdiction, let's just say we're in California. I would say give it um, one year. You know, you're going to be okay. one to three months of planning, getting through the planning process in your jurisdiction, and then um, one to three months of tidying up design and finding a builder, and then six months from start to finish to build. Okay. One year is realistic. I'd, I'd say an average is about nine months, but I always want to, you know, under promise and let people over deliver yeah. for themselves. Yeah. And again, could you, I, I guess the next question as somebody who's lived in a small home currently in 524 square feet. Do you see yourself ever, not like, do you, do you see yourself ever going bigger? Or are you just, you're happy where you're at? That's such a good question. My friends ask me that all the time. I'm going to go smaller. So what? my dream for the last few years has been to buy this. So this is not just a housing, it's a lifestyle thing. So I drive this yeah. old van. My car has 410,000 miles on it. Like I live a simple life. That's what keeps my mind free and allows me to go big. And right. the last couple of years, my plan has been to take a year off to buy a new truck with a, a chassis, take the bed off. And then I want to build this aluminum framed shelled cab over custom ski mobile. So think of like a cab over camper, like a big Lance that you would buy, but as opposed yeah. to being made out of cheap plastic parts, I want to build one all out of aluminum and then have okay. a custom simple interior. So I plan to move from my 524 square foot house into um, about 80 square feet onto this mobile ski bum rig that I haven't built yet, but I've been designing it in my mind for the past couple of years. And wow. um, I think next year, I've got a bunch of builds on the table right now. So I think 2025, the plan is to, is to downsize. But I do not see myself ever living in a bigger house. Again, I'm a free spirit. My mind is, is out there in the mountains. I don't right. need this big anchor. So yeah, smaller if anything, but even the 524 square foot I live in, I can vacuum everything with one plug. I can yeah. literally clean this house in 10 minutes. Um, I could take every textile in the whole home and fit it into the washer and dryer in one load. Um, little things like that, that people don't realize how powerful they are until you don't have to deal with them. Uh, yeah. The other thing I would say is the the efficiencies, You know, whether we do solar or not. Um, our utility and exchange commissions in our state just announced an 18% increase in electrical and mm. a 40% projected increase over the next three years. 
And cool. even with the standard building envelope, standard code model, which is nothing fancy, we're still twice as efficient is a 1200 square foot house that's built to the almost to the passive standard just because it's smaller and there's right. less areas for air to, to come in or escape. I mean, right. my my electrical bill, my utility bills are almost nothing, guys. Mm. It's so affordable to live in a small house. Now, what do you say to someone who's looking at this going, that's a great dream, Derek, your kids are older, blah, blah, blah. Um, what do you tell someone that, you know, that's maybe got infants or they're looking at the next 20 years of having you know a couple of kids at home what do you what do you say to that well i would say that everybody's goals are different and sure. if your goal is to have every child in a bedroom and a white picket fence out front with a dog and a two-car garage to put all your stuff like then go do that like i would say yeah. this may not be for you but i would tell people to consider how much better raising their children's life would be if they had more time and money to spend with them. Cause what I see mm. is most people, it's not like, Oh yeah, we're going to buy a four, four and I'm going to stay home and raise my kids. It's like, I have a four, four, but both parents work a job that they hate and they come home late and the nanny lives yeah. there. And I would say that, you know, 90% of the world lives in a third of the square footage that we do. And even the average American household today, which is 2.6 people, um, depending on the data that you, that you pull, that still is going to be, in most cases, um, parents or a parent in one room and a kid or at the very most 1.6 kids in the other room. Mm. So the the fact is, is these 800 square foot, six to 800 square foot houses are two twos. A lot of houses are being produced and built and designed right now that are under a thousand square feet that are three twos. Yeah. So just because the so the average house size right now is um, just over two thousand square feet. We've had the largest drop ever, three mm percent. -hmm. We went from yep. almost twenty one hundred down to two, and that's still over double what we practically need to house four people, let alone the national average. Um, I did a lot of data searching. You know, it's, it's kind of cool. This is a quick side note while doing some research for this topic. Um, some of the best data I found was from Lance and it's pretty neat when you're, when you're going deep into a network where you're an expert in and you see other experts that, you know, in different, uh, areas of the country that are in the same network. So that's one thing I love yeah. about you, Zuber, is you bring, not that we're, we're smart or we're special, but you, you bring a lot of people that care together. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out Lance Lambert, Resi Club, uh, the best data out there. Very inquisitive, great relationships. I'm so happy to talk to him every Thursday. Uh, and, and read his articles, uh, you know, five days a week. So great guy. Yeah. And it's, you're absolutely right. One of the things I love about this community is if you, if you manage the people that you let in and you let in repeatedly, it really does the momentum grows. So uh, it's, it's fun to watch. Um, I don't think we've spoken or have we spoken since the, the Fresno event uh, where you were a feature speaker? Yeah, yeah, we did. We talked. Um, we had so, one morning talk about okay. um, giving away uh, wealth. Oh, that's right. I remember that. Yeah, I forget. So, can can the belt that you uh, that you won actually fit in this small house, or does that does that have to be outside? <laughs> yeah, actually, funny enough, it will fit. Um, <laughs> it, and it is in my house. It will fit. Nice, I actually nice. thought about hanging it up on the wall here in my yeah. studio, and I was like, how cool would that be to just have a straight up like. Hulk Hogan Zuber Bell in the background. <laughs> that's still the best, not just the best stage gift. That's like the best gift I've ever gotten. Like that thing is burly. People look at it and they think, oh, that must be light. I just, I remember when you gave it to me, everybody, um, uh, you know, wanted to see it. And I said, you don't want to see it. Feel how heavy it is. So yeah. I got to know, Zuber, tell everybody right now you bought, gosh, you must've bought 25 of those. Uh, how much were the belts? Uh, combined over five grand. Yes. Wow. Wow, that was such a cool gift, man. You're awesome. Yeah, no, yeah, and again, the belts are very personal, right? Everybody's name on them, uh, your picture. picture. My intention was for you to put them on behind you on walls to be displayed. That was that was my vision. Is oh, is it's so uh, cool? Yeah. So so if something like Beth has it on her shelf already, um, Adrian put it on his shelf. So yeah, it's it's starting to happen. So it's it's fun. Yeah. That's awesome. It, yeah. Great event. For those of you that didn't go, you know, Zuber does an event now annually in yeah. Vegas, the one rental at a time event. And he gave away these like huge full-size professional leather plaqued WWF Metal. style <laughs> belts for the speakers. And it was, everybody was pretty taken back. You yeah, should have seen yeah. security at the airport when I wore my belt home. <laughs>
<laughs> it's funny. Some people uh, tried to get it through um, baggage claim, and they got little le- little notes saying we had to open your bag. See <laughs> what that metal thing was. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Back to the topic at hand. Sorry for that right turn. Um, again, I think living in small, uh, smaller homes have to be an answer to our housing uh, crisis. Um, I want to be very clear about something. I think we're going smaller. I actually told Lance, I think last week or the week before, that I hope this year we see a 5% drop in average square footage. And just so people realize, the crash bros are going to yell, scream, new home prices are crashing. Folks, they're not crashing. And I would argue you're a contractor. Cost per square foot's probably going up. It is. Is that all fair? Yeah, yeah, it is. And and this is happening really quickly. Like I was absolutely blown away when I started looking at the data of our average home size of 2,200 feet down to 21 highs and then now into the, the mid uh, 2000s. I am seeing in our area, and we're, we're on the leading edge of infill housing and not just accessory dwelling units, detached duplexes, triplexes, and quadplexes or cottage clusters. In Oregon, we're just in California as well. In Washington, we're building smaller house units. I'm seeing most of the stuff come on the market right now from the, the big local home builders that are absolutely cleaning house at eight, nine to 1350. Like 1400 square feet is a big three, two right now. And a lot of what's coming on the market are nice, well-designed, single level, two twos around a thousand feet. And I think this is my prediction. And here's a receipt, as you would say, I would say in the next five years, we're going to see that that home size nationally go down 20%. That's that's my prediction, which is huge. And um, our houses are going to be more efficient. They're going to live a little bit bigger and, and people are going to want to spend more time with their friends and family and outside and less time maintaining um, this, this big box. Yeah. So that's, and that's and having to work. And yeah, you know, like to your point, I think one of the big things is if we do, if we do this right, we could actually go back to a single uh, earner and, you know, mom or dad can stay home with the kids as opposed to great, you got the 4,000 or 5,000 square foot house. Now mom and dad have to work. Oh, by the way, mom and dad have to work a lot in high stress. And now the nanny's raising the kids or grandma or whatever, Nana. And um, I think if we do this right and we go smaller, it could get to a point where we only need one income. And, you know, maybe, mm. maybe life's better. Maybe our kids aren't so jacked up and messed up. I, you know, I don't, it's, it's, it's Maybe it's wishful thinking, but it's certainly something I'm thinking about. Wow, that's powerful. I, I've never thought about it that way, but you bring up a good point. Yes, if you can really drastically reduce or eliminate your housing cost, you need less income to live the life you want to live. That's for sure. One other thing I, mean, think I would about, add. Think about that San Antonio house, right? 661 square feet, 150 grand. You could you could live on that on, on one income. Oh you yeah, especially, especially you know another another good reason these are going to be good options, as you know, and as you speak about often, is these uh, builders can have these incentives where they adjust their margin and they buy down the rate. So you're also you're getting a cheaper house, you're getting a brand new unit that's going to be way more efficient. It's going to have way lower property taxes. It's going to have way less insurance burden. And oh by the way, you're going to get a point to point and a half rate better than everybody else because these builders have the firepower to help you get there. Yeah. And I'm not, and again, I'm not promoting yeah. any big home builders. You know, I'm, I'm more of a, a, a boutique, go find somebody local to help you build a small yeah. house, but it doesn't matter. Like I'm always going to cheer for people that have a good plan and want them to win. And right now it's, I really think it's the national home builders that they're keeping it kind of quiet. Like I, I, I oh, see yeah, the mainstream, yeah. but they don't want everybody to know their, their secret weapon, which is build smaller and make more money. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, this is what the this is what the crash bros don't get. They're like, hey, they're the prices are falling, they're going bankrupt, they're going into this. It's no folks. They're building smaller homes, they're producing more units per, I don't know, acre or whatever the hell the calculation is. They're making more money. Yeah. And one thing that uh another thing that I'll add to this is this model that the big home builders are using has to do with getting these more rural tracts of land as we do this urban sprawl and they're getting farther and far away from farther and farther away from these urban centers. And that's because the nicest land is always built out first. And that's why we're growing. With the infill housing movement and especially accessory dwelling units, we're able to build these small houses on areas that are close in that are in these nice 
already established single family neighborhoods where these builders are going into not wastelands, but they're going at farther out into less desirable areas. Um, just a quick little bit of data here. Since ADU movement really took hold with state law in California in 2017 through 2023, there were more than 80,000 accessory dwelling units built. So when we hear really? about these little developments wow. that Lennar or, um, you know, maybe Hayden Homes or maybe Horton is is planning or building of 100 or 950 or there's going to be 1500 here. Look at what's going on in California just by filling yeah. in the land we already have that nobody even knows about. I mean, over 80,000 units. That's incredible. That's crazy. I would not have guessed that. If you would have told me how many units to guess, I'd have been sub 20. So shout out to shout out to California to get something right. That's good. And it's it's just gaining more and more traction every day. So if you're listening and you're like, oh my gosh, I don't like my job. I don't like working so hard. I don't like cleaning my house or paying the cleaners every two weeks to come clean all these areas and rooms I don't even use. Consider a smaller house, folks. Yeah, again, if you just I'm just playing with this, right? When you think about where we are today or and and you know what would make things better, getting your housing costs cut in half, or dare I say zero by living in the ADU in the back, that can cure a lot of things. And and really I'm really stuck on this. You know what? You could you can have one parent stay home. I was lucky enough to be raised by uh you know, my mom stayed home until I was in high school. Right. Knowing that she was there, she picked us up from school. She dropped us off from school. Um, I got to tell you, I would have been a different person if she had to work. Right. There there was social influences that I could have gone the wrong way if I was a latchkey kid very easily, especially in junior high. Um, so I'm, you know, shout out mom for for and dad, I guess, in that case, for for uh, making that a possibility. And I think smaller homes bring that back. It really does feel like it, it could happen. Yeah. Great point. Yeah. So again, living in a 512, 24 square foot home, he is going smaller to 80 square feet. I don't generally recommend that small folks, you know, 524 is, is, is a good size. Um, gives you optionality, gives you the ability, like paint, do me a favor, paint an average week for me. How many times are you out running or skiing or just what does this freedom give you? What What is Derek doing during a week? Great question. So I, I work all the time, but I'm always working on the fly. So an average day, I'll get up, I'll drink about three cups of green tea, mate, gives me special mm -hmm. powers. I'll check emails. I answer a lot of emails on the YouTube channel or on my website about ADU related stuff. And then um, I'll do a run every day. I try to run 10 miles a day, 70 miles a week. So there's uh -huh. a, a couple of different routes when it's uh, snowy, I'll run in town. When it's not snowy, I run on the Pacific Crest Trail just up off of Mount Ashland behind me. And in a good uh, winter, I'll ski maybe 40 days a year. This year has been a pretty light year just because I'm so busy with projects. And then um, juggling different developments. We always have like one build of one or two units going. We have one build of one or two units in uh, permitting. And then we usually have one plan of one or two units in zoning. So there's mm -hmm. kind of like this slow conveyor belt, slow and steady, but I'm able to, you know, kind of do it at my own pace. Every day I'm delegating a little bit more. I'm really bad at the delegate delete piece. I'm mm -hmm. working on that. So I still have my hands in everything and I still work more than I should. And my, my kids would still um, like to see me more, but I have the freedom today to, to pull off of the, the throttle if I need to, um, sure. which is a luxury I didn't have, you know, I was a fireman. I, the last 15 years of my career, I, I worked as a professional fireman and I was seeing fire and dead people and, and things that, you know, aren't, um, as freeing as the things I get to see now. So it really is a life by design. And I did that by living smaller, driving old cars and buying assets, not liabilities. It's honestly that simple folks, but nobody, not nobody, but very few people want to make those long-term sacrifices, delay gratification to live a life beyond their wildest dreams. So now I wake up in this tiny house and, and honestly, the world is my playground. Even if I mm. chose, choose to work a lot, um, I have a lot of freedom to be outside yeah. and be in the sun. And I'll tell you really quickly, what really set this up for me is, is several years ago, I was doing my goals and I wrote down 10 things that bring me the most joy in my life. And I wrote them out and they're simple. They're like music and dogs and sunshine and running and skiing out of those 10 things. Only one of them had anything to do with money and it changed the way I thought it changed the way I acted and it's changed my life. So I would just ask 
people out here that are listening that, that think, oh, well, you know, Derek's got a different path. I couldn't do that. Bull crap. Like you totally can just figure out what you want and then reverse engineer what you have to do to get there. So many people I talk to and we talk to and we try to help. They think they know what they want, but it's like, no, what do you really want? And for me, it was just a simple lifestyle and, you know, small housing and old cars play into it. <laughs> I love that exercise. The 10 things that bring you joy. I, I, I am curious when you sat down to do that, um, did you, did it, uh, did it just click or did it, did you have to like grind on it for a little bit? No, no, it was actually really simple. I look, I was just looking for my journal. I was actually going to just read them. I, you know, I'm, I'm an open book. Um, but no, it was pretty simple. I, I did add a couple things, um, to it later because I shared it openly in one of, one of the, the groups I'm in the small mastermind, I, I shared the things and they said, no, well, you're, you're also this and you're this. And I went, oh, okay. Yeah. I need to add those on there, but no, the, the 10 things that brought me joy. I mean, I, I wrote them out pretty much line by line. And it, it turns out I'd been thinking about them for years. I just didn't know it. It's like the two most important questions. What do you want? And what do you really want? <laughs> and until I saw it, you know, put pen to paper and saw what it was, I realized that none of it had anything to do with flash or fluff or money. It, it yeah. was all about like a simple, healthy lifestyle. Another reason I, I really click with um, Coach Carson is, is the, you know, getting to enough and taking the off ramp. Like we don't all yeah. have to go for the moon. Like people just think because other people around them are getting more units that you should probably just go get more units. And really what you should get is more joy. And by no means have I, you know, aced that test. I'm I'm working on it. It's definitely a work in progress. But I didn't have that maturity when I was younger. I I, I had other directions and it, it's taken a long time in this business to really understand that less is more. And that's well, not, me, just how, me, not just let housing. Me, let me ask you a question. How old are your kids again? Um, I've got two boys that are 18 and 19 and okay. then um, a blended family with two girls that are uh, 10 and 14, 11 and 14, 11 yesterday. Oh, happy, uh, happy belated birthday. So let's talk about the the boys first and we'll go to the, the, the next set in a minute. So 18 and 19, they could sign for loans, right? Um, are they, do they see the tiny home is, is a way to, because again, they're 18 and 19, dude, they could be financially free by 25. I mean, if they followed your path, let's just put it out there. So have they, have they seen what you've done, Derek, and said, Hey, I want some of that. Or have they been like lots of kids saw what you did, saw that you worked forever and they're doing the exact opposite. You know, that's a great question. And I'll, I'll start this off by saying the one mistake that I made, which is the biggest mistake looking back on my life was I was in such a hurry to get through this process and get to financial freedom. So I could be with my kids that by the time I got there, they were pretty much old enough to like, want to go do their own thing. So I would tell you, I, yeah, I would tell you right now to like, try to hit the brakes if you can, when your kids are young, they're only that age once, um, yeah. two boys, 18 and 19, one of them lives in an ADU you know, has a good job, spends every dime he can get his hands on. They both were raised the exact same way. The other is um, already has a credit card, has a good credit score, applied for a loan to buy a house at 18 years old. My lender said, come back in about 120 days. We'll get you, we'll get you there by opening three lines of credit. Here's a really quick hack for people. If you want to help your kid get credit to buy a house, put them on your credit card as an additional user, when the card shows up, cut it up, but they automatically get access to your high credit. And then the mm -hmm. two other lines, we got him an unsecured, he got him an unsecured credit line with the local credit union. And then he has like a tire account. So these three line items of accounting, along with his good job, he'll be able to buy a house in about four months. So to answer your question, I've got one that's on track to financial freedom at 18 without my guidance and another son that's brilliant, that's gonna, he's gonna be fine but he doesn't save money. He likes to spend it. So it's this weird um, dichotomy of like the, the exact same financial upbringing and, and two complete opposite um, money relationships. So I really think it's a crapshoot. You know, you can teach mm -hmm. everybody, um, but people just are wired differently. And yeah, I would know I, both, yeah. the both kids know that they're not getting anything. Like they're not going to, generational wealth in my mind uh, doesn't exist. I, I want to teach generational skills. They're not right. going to get a portfolio of houses where they don't have to work and they can just take care of dad's business. Um, they know it's all getting given away. It's going to be given away. So hopefully that will motivate them to, you know, build their own joy. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the, it sounds like you got a second attempt with the blended family with, with some young ones. 
uh, what what might you be doing different this time? Just trying to kill old habits. I mean, I'll just be honest about this. We had a, a birthday breakfast for our 11 year old yesterday and I'm like answering emails and working and, mm. and it's like, it's still Derek, a leave, struggle. Leave, leave that thing in the car, man. I know it's still a struggle. And I want to, I want to be honest about that. It's still yeah, a struggle for me, but I know I can identify it and I'm working on trying to be more present and work less because I do get a second chance at this. Um, but it, it's hard when your passion is your art and yeah. it, it's always with you. I think, you know, one of the best things I'm going to have to do is just, you know, turn off the stuff. If I have the stuff in front of me, I can't put it down. So, um, yeah, you know, what, turning what off, I what, turning off just, the hotline. So what, something I've done. One of the things that Olivia calls me on sometimes is we go out, we go out to eat every day, but lunch or dinner, one of the two. And she's nailed me a few times about being on the phone, right? Just answering texts or comments or whatever, right? What I've had to do, Derek, is I gotta leave it in the car. Just it's just like a habit now. So I've had to break down and just leave the damn thing in the car. Yeah, great advice. Like I'm, I'm still learning. I'm, I'm trying to be better. At least this time around, I'm aware of it, and I try yeah. to. Yeah, <laughs> so um, one step in the right direction. Yeah, no better to do better. And you know, yesterday was a, you know, a pretty extreme example of that. But it's still yeah. something that comes up when you're passionate about what you do and helping other people and giving good service. Yeah, like you're, you're always on. Like that's just that's all there is to it. Yeah, no, I definitely feel the same way. Derek, you're amazing, man. Thank you for coming here. Thank you for this topic. Uh, I look forward to talking to you again. Where can people find you? You can find me at that ADU guy. I'm most active on YouTube and on Instagram. And I reach out to everybody that that's, uh, has a question. I try to get back to you. It's me. There's no VAs. There's no bots. Yeah, me if too. You send me yeah. a comment. It's me. And I'll give you more than I'll give you more than two words like Zuber does because I have way <laughs> less followers. Hey, at least I try to reply to everybody. You reply to <laughs> everything. I was watching the Zoom tube last night at like eleven, and you you, res, res, you always respond within an hour to every comment. It may be short, but I know you see it, so that's cool. Yeah, yeah, that's the key. I, the reason I respond is because I want people to know I saw it. That's that's what's important to me uh, is reading those. Um, if somebody wanted to watch the six hours uh, of you building this five hundred twenty four square feet, is there a specific playlist for that? On your yeah. channel? Yep. How to build an ADU with cost breakdown. Folks, go check it out. It is amazing. Thanks, buddy. Thank you.